Shall we start? Um, so today we are going to explore as much as we can in uh, one hour and a half uh, what we can do when we are up there. So when we have perfect observations about the environment and we know exactly what the laws that govern the system are. Okay, these laws might well be. Stochastic, right? So it need not be deterministic, but we know the uh, in in the mark of uh, chain language, we know the transition probability for this. But before getting into this, which will require a little bit of calculations, and uh, we will in the end derive a main result uh, and basically summarize in one hour and a half the work of many many people over more than a decade, around uh, the fifties of the last century. Uh, let's go back to examples first in order to get an idea of, in a very simple case, of where we are in this uh, diagram, what are the things we're talking about. So I redraw the two main uh, concepts that I want to use uh, to orient ourselves in the, in the problem of reinforcement learning in general. So like I said yesterday, there is an agent. The agent continuously interacts with the environment, gets as percepts a couple of inputs. One of these is the reward, the immediate reward for some action that has been taken while being in some environmental state ST. The environmental state need not be accessible in general to uh, the agent, but it might get some observation out of it, which hopefully conveys some information about the environment itself. And on the basis of this, it just builds some policy, which is a way of mapping actions, mapping, sorry, the history of all experiences gathered up to the time into some action, okay? And the goal is to find the action that maximizes some discounted form of the reward. I will rewrite this again for you. So the goal is to maximize over the policies, uh, the expected value of a sum, okay, let's say, let's say we start conventionally at time t equals zero, then this will be the sum over all the future of gamma t times the reward at the subsequent time rt plus one. Okay, where gamma is this discount factor which expresses how far in the future you want to look. So this is based at time t equals zero. If the, if the environment is changing, of course, this might carry on another formula which I wrote yesterday, but that's just intended as a reminder here, okay? So, and, and then we were discussing this example, which is a very simple example in which there's just one state. Now, since there is just one state, there's little to be observed here, right? So we are actually moving up above here. But still there's, a, there's all these axes which has to be explored. And we will see what, what these things mean in any case. But first, first, let's identify simply in this diagram what are the concepts that are written here. So the agent, okay, the agent is the agent here which decides what to do. Uh, this is the state of the environment, which is always the same. 
So this, the environment evolves just like a state, given state, next time the same state, next time again, again the same state, with probability one. Nothing happens, okay? It seems to be a very dumb environment. Then what the agent does has the opportunity of choosing between two actions, and he can select one of these two actions with a given probability, which would be pi one or pi naught in this case, so this probability distribution, and of course, since the agent has to do something, they must sum up to one. So there's just one uh, independent number here running from zero to one. It chooses action zero. If it chooses that, then two things may happen. So there's some random process decided by the environment on which the agent has no control, which will give either an outcome of one as immediate reward with probability p naught, and an outcome of one minus p naught with probability minus one. Otherwise, if the agent selects action one, the same thing will happen with different probabilities p one. Okay, this is just one. Simple example of the decision process. Uh, so you might think, and we're going to take a poll about this, is this a mathematical oddity or does it have to do with any, with some particular decision process which is relevant to us humans? So who thinks that this stuff is just, okay, simple mathematical example? I mean, both statements are true, yeah, okay. But who thinks that this is prevalently a mathematical toy? And who thinks, oh no, this thing is very interesting because I have an example in mind. So who thinks that this is a math mathematical toy? Okay, who thinks that this is an example of decision making for real? Okay. One among you, what, what, what kind of thing do you have in mind? Or an action which is shorter in time. That's very abstract. So, like a cigarette at the bus. Cigarette at the bus? Or like a cigar, which is longer. So, I have a greater probability to finish my cigarette than my cigar. And either I can get the reward of finish what I'm doing or the punishment of having to throw away the cigarette. Okay, fine. Good enough. That's, that's a nice example. Okay, uh, that's okay. It, there's a little bit of other complication in this example is that you have to gauge the value for time that you're waiting, okay, which is not, not immediately mapped into this. Just one, one more example. Sorry? Lottery is the example. Very good. So we, we will go through that example because that's an example in which this kind of uh, problems actually uh, were born. So for this example, I will need a volunteer. You. <laughs> Please come around the, the desk. So I, I took two coins here from my pocket, and I'm putting here one here and one here. Right? Uh, you are the agent. You have to flip one of these coins. You decide which coin zero or coin one. You flip the coin, and then if it's head, you will get one euro. Really? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just not for me. And if it gets uh, tail, you will have to give me one euro. <laughs> That's for you. You already know the state of the coin. Yeah. Speak up. Question. No, but, uh, let's postpone just for a second the question. So do you recognize that this is the same thing? Yeah. Do you agree? Any stop? Okay. What, what, what is the state? He completely knows the state. He says, 
He completely knows the state. Well, the state, of course, he knows. There's no state to be known here. No, the state of form, which one is the Ah, you mean you, he knows the model. He knows what probabilities are to be flipped. Do you know this? What are the probabilities? Half. No. Why? <laughs> What? <laughs> this is even more surprising than this. <laughs> are, the, are the coins fair? Yeah, we, we cannot, we cannot you cannot tell. I just put two coins out of my pocket. You're just assuming a lot of things about me. You don't know me. <laughs> you will get to know me soon. <laughs> okay? Nobody knows. You can make an assumption. You can say, okay, I think that the coins are... Uh, Fair. Okay, in that case, what will be your decision? My decision? Yeah. If I, it, yeah, which one would, do you want to flip? This one. This one. Why? No preference. Pardon? I have no preference. You have no preference, yeah, right. Because that's, if you have an expectation that these two probabilities will be the same, there's, there's no point in choosing one or the other, right? But that's an assumption about how the world goes, right? Another thing is if I told you, so this coin is biased, because all my coins are biased. And this is 60% in favor of being, uh, say, tail. And this one is 60% in favor of being head, of being, yeah, head. Which one would you flip? This one. This one. Given that information, you would choose that, that one. OK? Does it make sense? Yeah. Now I recall you that not later than yesterday, at some time, some people propose that you have to choose proportionally to the probabilities. So does it make sense? Do, should I flip 60% this one and 40% the other? Okay, so that answers the question. And we will see how it comes from. So is it a general lesson that given the full knowledge of the environment, so given this P note and P1, the best strategy is always deterministic? Yes, I hear a resounding yes. So who thinks yes? Raise your hand. But given that we know the probabilities. Given that you know the probabilities. Good. Who, who thinks the opposite? OK, very good. Enough for spending <laughs> half an hour on proving that. So, OK? It will turn out that for these kind of problems, unless there is some degeneracy, that is, you get the same thing, in which case that's indifferent. But if there's, this degeneracy is lifted and there is actually is a way of getting the best result out of this, then it will be obtained by the deterministic policy. Or at least it can be always be obtained by the deterministic policy. Okay? That's true when you know everything. So when I tell you this is 60%, this is 40%, we are staying. Thank you very much. I will call you back again soon. <laughs> We are here, right? We said we are top, at the top here because there's nothing to be observed. And we are on the far right because we know the laws that govern our world. And the laws that govern our world, our world here is the nature of the coins, how much they are, how much they are biased. Is it clear? OK, then let's remove this kind of gracious information that I gave. And we are back one step and say, at the beginning, you don't know. You don't know. But are you entirely ignorant about this? Now, you know something. You know that this is, nonetheless, a Bernoulli process. Because the outcomes can only be head or tail with a certain probability. So you might not know the values of, the, sorry, the values of these probabilities, but you know that the structure of the process. You know that it will never come to if I flip it, it will never be dragon, okay? It can be head or tail, okay? So you know something about the structure of the model, and you have to guess what the parameters of the model are. And if you get information about the parameters, and this you do by experience, you can improve your way of making decisions. This is what happens when you are in the middle. You know something about the environment that is. These are coins. They are not expected to fall 
exactly in this way. I will never be able to do this, of course. You don't expect any time to happen, this, this to happen, right? <coughs> it might, in principle. But you are attributing zero probability to this event. So in which case the process is Bernoulli, and it's just an assumption, and then you have to understand what the, the, the probabilities are, right? So you are here in the middle. And then there is, if you move further, further here on the right, there is the extreme. The, the extreme situation is the one in which, for instance, uh, I, I give you the coins, you don't know anything about it. You flip the coin, you get some result, then I put the coins again in my pocket. I pull out one pair of coins. Might be the same one, maybe not. This is the case of a rigged lottery. Rigged, you know what rigged means? It's uh, cheating, one way cheat, okay? I might pull out, if you win, I might pull out a different kind of coins and then adjust to your decision to make this against your will. This would be, an, so technically it's called an adversarial lottery. In this case, you know very little about the environment because the environment is changing as you do things against you. Can you still win at this game? Are there algorithms that do that? You can try, yeah, exactly. That's one way. But you see the complication with that, right? So <laughs> increasingly, if you move from this side, and this, this, I hope it's clear for you. If I give you the probability, it's a matter just of computing, right? You have to piece of paper or intuition in this very simple case, and then you will make a decision, and the decision is correct. But there's no learning in that. What did you learn? You could have guessed this without flipping any coin. I told you, this is 60%, this is 40%. Nobody flips any coin, you know already what to do. There's no learning in that. When you know that it's Bernoulli, there has to be some learning, because you don't know in advance what the probability will be. You might say, okay, I think that he looks like an honest person, so perhaps it's 50-50. Bad guess, bad guess, but too bad for you. But experience will show you that I'm not that honest and the coins are, are biased in some way. And then you go to the other case where you don't, not only you have to learn the probability with which th these events comes, but the process which generates this ever-changing probability, which is an even more complicated task and requires a lot of learning, okay? You know, you know something. Exactly. You know something. You still know that it's Bernoulli, but this probability would be changing every time, depending on the past history as well. Okay. So again, you know something. There's an even worse case in which, again, it could happen. Anything could happen. The, the coin could disappear while in flight. It could end on an edge. It could show dragons. If it's a, if it, if this lottery is dimensionally rise, then then it's just a machine that you find in. in a, in a bar in which you press a button. Well, you, you put a lot of confidence on that that it will always show you the same results, right? But you don't know. You don't know. Okay, so this is far on that side. Okay, so these kind of decision problems are actually extremely famous. And, and, and besides this very simple example that I gave you, uh, which is the one a lot, we actually a very, very serious and interesting applications. I will just mention a couple of them, okay? So one of them is, you should be familiar with that. It's advertisement on, on internet. So in these days, if you click on a Wikipedia web page, you will get a banner which says, please donate. But it doesn't say always the same, doesn't give always the same text. Okay? There are several of these different ads with different texts. So this is exactly the same process. Suppose that there are just two ads. Now the agent is Mr. Wiles. Is, is that his name? No, I don't remember. Oh, well, Mr. Wikipedia, okay? He is the agent. And you have, he, he, the agent chooses whether to send out to you 
who are the environment now, you uh, clicking on the Wikipedia page, you are the environment, you are sent banner zero or banner one. And then with certain probability, you will donate, usually very, very small, okay? Otherwise, it just, it will return zero reward for the agent to Wikipedia, right? Then what, there are algorithms that take very seriously this kind of process and decide online which kind of banners to propose in order to get the most out of you. So the one which is more efficient is discovered by trial and error. So you don't know in advance how much a banner will be effective. Okay, so it's the case like you don't know what the probabilities of the coins are. But you will repeat this game and you will run out to do this. And of course, it's small amounts multiplied by millions, if not billions of clicks, which make out a substantial amount of money. Okay? You have to discover. And click many times on Wikipedia page and notice that. Okay? There are, there are results about this, about past uh, campaigns. Uh, I have figures for that if, you, if you're interested. So typically the amount of money that you get for every click is, is minuscule. It's, I don't know, one, one hundredth of a, a cent of a dollar. It's it's subtler because there's not an immediate reward in that case. It's 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 a little bit more complicated to map. So it's unclear whether how much YouTube gets advantage directly from that. But yeah, you could, you could assimilate more generally to this. Okay, this is a more direct example. The second example, which is which is even more serious, is uh, uh, how do you make clinical trials? Clinical trials. So you have some treatment for some illness. And you have to check whether it's working or not. And you have to do this by comparing the treatment with the placebo. The placebo is something that looks like but doesn't do anything, right? So in that case, you have two options, placebo or treatment. And the outcome will be how effective it is on the patient. And you have repeated trials to do. And patients come in with time, OK? Sometimes you have a cohort of large cohort available, but for some uh, rare disease, you just have one patient coming and then another one in three weeks and then another one in five months. So, and as they come, you have to learn how effective it is. Because you don't want to wait 10 years before discovering that that treatment was actually extremely good or maybe had a, neg had a negative outcome. So as this data come in, and this is again the same process. Now all this kind of process actually go under one name, and the name is, comes again from the lottery uh, jargon. These are called multi-armed bandits. What does that mean? So who? This is the name of this kind of processes in which there is one state and many actions to be taken, okay? There is an obvious generalization of this with zero, one, two, capital A minus one actions, okay? With, and then the rewards might be Bernoulli or whatever, Gaussians, okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, all this class of process go under the name of multi-armed bandits. They are part of a class, bigger class which is called sequential allocation problems which is even wider, and it's an enormous field of research for operations research, so for decision-making in factories, in uh, uh, logistic. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge field of mathematics, okay? So what does that mean? What, what, what does this have to do with this simple model? Uh, so who knows what, what a one-armed bandit is? Ever, ever heard about a one-armed bandit? No. Sorry? A slot machine. Why, why is that? Yeah, slot machines have one arm and you have to pull the single arm, right? These are old slot machines, mechanical ones. You pull the arm and then if you were lucky, coins would pour into your basket. Why a bandit? 
it gets away with your money. Yeah, right. That, that's that's the reason. Multi-arm bandits are just bandits with several arms, right? So this is a two-armed bandit. You can pull arm zero or arm one, and then with a certain probability, we'll get the coin, or just suppose you put. Yeah, you get one euro or you lose one the euro that you put, whatever, okay? You, you can clearly see the analogy. Fine? So these problems, in their simplicity, are extremely interesting. Still the subject of open research. Many counterintuitive results on this. This will be our workhorse, number one. So we will come back to this problem repeatedly. Today we will treat it in this corner, then we will discuss what happens here, and then we will discuss over there. It will accompany us, because it's very intuitive, it's simple, but it's very rich, and not trivial at all in practice, okay? So, before uh, getting back again to this problem, which we'll discuss in, in greater detail, I would like to give you a few other examples of uh, uh, decision-making processes which you can uh, in which the exercise is to understand what the things are here. So what is the environment, what is the agent, okay, what are the actions to be taken. Uh, so I, I don't have much time to do all the examples, so I will just focus on a couple of them. One is taken uh, from, uh, actually from physics. So this is example number one. Example number two is uh, called the cart pole. So I'm, I'm discussing briefly qualitatively this example because this will be the one over which you will be able to train your deep Q learning algorithm on next Tuesday and Wednesday in order to understand what is the best policy, okay? You will be running, basically, what is AlphaGo doing on a super trivial mechanical task like this one I'm describing, okay? This is just to avoid the complication of, well, you, you will discover. So what's the cart pole? The cart pole is a very simple task. It's, there is a cart. And on top of this cart, attached to a hinge, there is a pole, a stick, okay? So the task is to keep the pole within a certain angle. Why is that difficult? It, it's only hinged here, right? There's a hinge, there's just a hinge at the bottom. So why is it difficult? It's unstable, right? It doesn't stay like this. It will fall down on one way or the other. So how can you keep it in place? Suppose it's falling this way. What can you do to keep it in place? You can move the cart and recover, right? So it's a balancing act. It's, uh, okay. so it's, it's what, what you would do intuitively. This is pretty stable because water is on the bottom, but so if it goes this way, I will try to compensate, right? This kind of thing. So it's possible to cast this cart pole problem in this framework. So what's the state of the system for this thing? What is the state of the system? Good. This is one degree of freedom. So the state is described by, let's say, the angle theta that the pole makes with respect to the vertical. Position and velocity of the cart. And position is enough, someone proposes. Yeah. Angular speed, right? Okay. So I would settle for this within the Newtonian framework, right? So it's, a, it's a just a system with two degrees of freedom, angle and position of the cart, and the associated momenta, which are the angular momentum and the linear momentum. Of course, it's not. It's not this one. Of course, it isn't. It's a. It's a situation where 
there there are laws of motion. So we are not here at the top. We are, I mean, I'm including. Well, no, you don't. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, that's a good question because this poses the question: What are the actions that you can do? Okay, so the point is making is right. Uh, if I could act directly on the pole, okay, if I could just decide what to do with this, then I would have just to control the angle. Okay, that is that what you have in mind, right? So I didn't specify that. You can't do that. Okay, what you can do is just act on this variables. I would say that in order to describe what will happen in the future, you would need position and momentum and oh, linear momentum, momentum velocity, horizontal velocity. Why not position? Okay, uh, let, let's say, let, let's settle for for something we all agree on. So is it okay for you to describe this mechanical system with all these degrees of freedom? Fine, good, okay. So there might be some situation, I, I will get to this to this comment in a second. There might be some situation where you might, might have a compact, more compact description of the system which might apply, okay. I will answer directly to your question about position in a second. Uh, then the actions that you can take, like I said, is the force, is a linear force which acts only on positions, okay? So the actions are force on x. Right? So your dynamics will be x dot equals v, say n is equal to 1, and V dot equals F. And then there is the reaction of the pole on the cart. And this, this will be the equation for the cart, okay? You will see all this in detail in the, in, the, in the example, right? So this is the kind of actions that you can take. Now, we have what, what's left still to do? So this is the state of environment. You have to define the percept, so rewards. So rewards can be, for instance, you get a reward every time that you are within that angle. And when you get outside of that angle, you get some penalty, for instance. Uh, on, in addition to this, you might want to put uh, boundaries on this. So every time that you move and you hit on boundaries, you stop the system, for instance, right? And then you get a big penalty for that. In this case, position obviously arises. You see, this, there are many ways of shaping this reward function for this. Okay, so what are observations in this case? Well, you look at your system, you might be able to measure position, angular velocity, linear uh, velocity, all the things you might be able to measure them with arbitrary precision for all practical purposes. Or it might be a very coarse description. Or you might say, OK, I'm, I want to control this system, but I only look at the position of the angle. I don't care where the cart is. Okay? This might be good at some point, but you will hit on the boundary, for instance. So it's, not, it's, a, it's a very incomplete information for that part of the problem, which Meta said, I have to keep, it, keep the cart within a certain range of distance. You see? The only exercise I want to do now is just that you feel at ease with this description and say, okay, it includes all this. I think it makes sense. I can work out some specific uh, instances in one case or the other. Of course, if you change slightly the definition, the task will be slightly different. But you would ex what you would expect in practice for the system to do is just to stay very close to the vertical position. The percept is just a couple of the rewards that you take, the one that I was discussing. You get a positive reward if you are within that angle. 
and you get a negative one if you're out, you get a negative reward if you bump in, uh, into the boundaries. And the percept is uh, the outcome of your measurement of the, all this state, which might be coarse-grained uh, observable of this, say this plus Gaussian errors at every time, this might be the observables, or it might be as well the state itself, perfect observation. If the observation is perfect, yt coincides with st. You know everything about the system. Good? Any question? Third example, it's called grid world. So this is a very simple example of a navigation problem. So there is some notion of space, say a square grid, square two-dimensional grid, like, uh, so we have, I'm drawing, can you, can you see? Can you see? Yeah. So I'm drawing quite simple. It's a grid like this. Then there are some points on the grid which are sort of canceled out. There is some uh, point in the grid which is uh, uh, a starting point. What is the meaning of grid? Grid word, word, word. There is some starting point and there is some arrival point T, capital T. So the agent is a is a worker, which can jump on agents and sides of this lattice. Okay. It can make a move from here to here, or from here to here, from here to here. So what is the state of the system in this case? Is the position of this agent on the chess board, if you wish, on this board. So if the agent is here, this is the position of the agent. So capital A is very bad because it looks like an action, but this is the position of the agent. So if I say this is ST, it means that the agent is in position two, four in my, on my board, okay? This is the state of the agent, which is also the state of the environment, right? It's the position of the agent relative to the environment. Then what are the actions? So the actions might be north, west, south, east. That is, the agent decides that it wants to go in up, left, down, or right, whatever you prefer, okay? So there might be four actions in the system. Then the outcome of these actions might be random. So the agent might, for instance, say, I wanna go north if there's a loud space. Suppose the agent is here and says, okay, let, let's put it here. It's here, it wants to go south, it can, but it goes there just with the probability, say, one minus epsilon. And with probability epsilon over three, it chooses to go in the other direction. So there is an error in the actuation of the, of the policy. If an action is taken, sometimes there's an error and this little robot cannot make a step in the direction he wished, and maybe it goes this way or this way or back, or it stays in place, whatever. So this is how the environment changes as a result of the action. And this probability, this transition probability from one position to another is our model of the environment. As these are the rules, the laws, which are obeyed by the environment under some action. Is that clear? In this case, what are the rewards? For instance, might be that the rewards are no reward unless you sit on the, the state T, in which case you get a positive reward. So the rewards depend on the state on which you are. Observations, well, the agent might know very well where it is. Suppose that it has some sort of GPS system that tells you, okay, I'm in position two, four. Or the agent might not know where it is in absolute space. 
So this is changing the quality of the observation. If he knows it very well, it would be up here. If he doesn't know it, it would be down there. So what is the final task? The final task with the reward that I just described is to get there as fast as possible and then stay there forever. This is the best thing you can do. So eventually in a problem like this, if you train well your algorithm, it will be able to find the shortest path, the shortest admissible path to reach the target and stay there. May know, may know, in which case you're up here, or may not know. It might discover it. So, so when it discovers it, it has all the information of the system. That's how the algorithm could work, right? You discover where it is, and you might know that you get a reward, or you might know where the target is upon first discovery, and then get back in a second trial, you will be already able to do this. Or you're, in that case, up in the upper corner, you know everything. You know this, you know all the probabilities of jumping, given the actions that you decide. If you're given everything, again, it's a computational problem. Much more difficult than this one, of course, but still, the goal is to understand how to compute these things. Okay? So I hope this sort of covers, there, there are many, many examples of this, of course. Actually, it's, it's more difficult to find situations where, which you cannot really cast in this framework. The environment is, is the grid. And the state is the position of the robot with respect to the grid. It doesn't know. It doesn't know. You're here below. The environment is still the same. It's just the, 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 the observations that you get, the percepts that are very, very bad. But, but you will have to decide based on the percepts, not on the state, because you don't know it. So that's why the problem is more difficult. It's just like navigating, but you're blind. OK? Good. So let's get back to this simple problem. <coughs> and uh, uh, we, we just have to... Uh, to do some, some very simple, so we had this intuition with the coins uh, that the best action to take actually is the one with the largest P. If P1 is larger than P0, then take action one, always, then vice versa. So this example is so simple that we, you can actually work out explicitly the calculations. So that's what we would do, and just take a couple of lines. So we are gonna evaluate this thing for this simple model. It's just a couple of lines. So let's start for, for with the first step, t equals zero, first step. First step, gamma to the power zero, no, no matter what my discount factor is, okay, it will be one, the prefactor. And then I have to take the expectation of my reward. So what do I expect in this case? I said, with probability pi naught, I will take action zero. So the first term in that sum, let me call this, um, let me call this capital G for a second, just for compactness. So with capital G, okay, first step, I take action zero with probability pi naught, which is my policy. And this is one thing I want to, I want to know how much this thing depends on the policy. So this is a function of the policy. And I want to optimize over the policy. So pi note, then what can happen? It can happen that with probability p note, I get plus one. And with probability one minus p note, I get minus one. Otherwise, I pick action pi one, 
and with probability p1, I get 1, plus 1 minus p1, I get minus 1. And this was the contribution from the first step. And then I'm back here again. Okay. So I am locked into this uh, cycle where everything gets back again to the same starting point. Next step, well, first of all, now I have to discount. So time has elapsed. So the, the reward, the gain that I will get from this new round of action will be discounted, will be smaller by a factor gamma. But apart from that, it will repeat itself. Everything will be the same. I'm fresh and new, and I do another round. So this will be exactly the same. And I'm rewriting this, this minus this, it makes two pi note minus one, and then I have this, but this pi one is nothing but one minus pi note, and this is again, uh, sorry, what am I writing? Uh, this is pi note, one minus pi note, yes. Uh, 2p1 minus 1. And so on and so forth. Plus gamma squared, the same thing. Are you okay with this simple calculation? Yeah, pi naught is the probability of picking action zero, and pi one is the probability of picking action one, and they have to sum up to one, which is what I used here. Yeah? So we are doing an expectation value on which probability pi zero and pi naught? All of this. There's a whole single Markov process which depends on probability distributions for these events to occur, and for the probability of actions to be taken. Okay. So at every time there's a policy which I decide, a probability distribution, I flip a coin, okay, or I throw a random variable, and I decide, am I gonna pick action zero or one with probability pi zero or one minus pi zero? And then the environment acts randomly and returns me plus one or minus one with probability pi zero or one minus pi zero and so on and so forth. So we are doing actually the expectation value on the pool process. Okay, so all these terms will be the same. This is just, this happens just because you always end up in the same state. And the only thing that changes is this discounting for future. So when you sum up all these terms, it's one plus gamma plus gamma squared, it's a geometric sum. So that eventually the final result is that, let me, Okay, I will write here. Your final result is that how much you can gain on average given a certain choice for the policy, so given a certain probability distribution, is one over one minus gamma times, now I'm again, two P one minus one plus pi naught two pi zero minus p1. So this is again the same thing. I just rearranged the terms here. You can check that that's exactly this, okay? This clearly depends only on pi naught because pi one is locked to be one minus pi naught. And now you can ask the question, what is the best policy? I have to find the maximum of this quantity over all pi nodes that clearly, since these are probabilities, are confined between zero and one. So what, where is the maximum? Where is the maximum? You make the derivative, yes. It's a linear function. You can also go through for that, right? Without making too much analysis. Where's the maximum? So this is a linear function as of pi, right? So it can be either like this or this. It depends on what? On the sine of pi naught plus. So if pi naught is larger than pi one, you will have to put pi zero to one. That's the best thing you can do. Otherwise, you will put pi naught to zero. Are you okay with this? So max over pi of g pi is 
if p naught is larger than p1, then I'm going to put a 1 here, and I'm going to get 2 times p naught minus 1 divided 1 minus gamma. Otherwise, Two p one minus one one minus gamma. In this case, the best action, the best policy is to choose pi zero equals one. That's the best policy. And in this case, the best policy is to choose pi one equals one. Okay, we're just computing the thing and showing that our intuition was correct. You always have to play the coin which you know in advance has the best probability of giving you a positive reward. Okay. It's a pretty straightforward calculation, and it's totally useless. Because as long as you go away from this simple example, it's a mess. Okay, But I'm showing this just because you can do it, and then it, it's fair to show it. But I'm going to give you an example now of a slight change of uh, uh, our problem, which already makes it pretty cumbersome to calculate directly this optimal policy. And this variation is actually pretty simple. It's a situation in which, so let's go back to the demonstration. So these are the two coins here, left and right. So this was the previous problem, this one. Now I have another pair of coins here. I had to buy many coffees this morning in order to get all the coins for this. I'm putting them on the other side, okay? So these two have different probabilities in general, right? So this might have P naught, P1, and this two might have two different P's. Say P prime naught and P prime one. Then the game is slightly changed and then if you keep these two systems decoupled, okay, suppose that at, the, at each step you cannot play both of them. So you have to be either here and flip this coin or there, right? And then the game is the same for each two, so you always get plus one or minus one depending on if it's head or tail. But now you have to pay a cost. You have to pay me 20 cents if you wanna cross this. There's a bridge and I'm here and I want 20 cents to move on the other side, okay? So now the complication is that if you are here, you might as well know what to do. If you know in advance what the probabilities are there, you might also know that this is more advantageous to you to play over there. But you will have to play a cost, to pay a cost to get there. So is it worth? It depends on many things. So one thing you might have noticed from here is that this result does not depend on gamma. The outcome depends on gamma, but the policy does not depend on gamma. It does not depend on the horizon. Why is that? Because you always back to time zero, right? It's just like a Bill Murray movie that is always in the same place every day, okay? Same time. But this is not generic. This is the extension. Now, this system has two states. There is the state A and the state A prime each of which has its own probabilities and in general rewards. And then there is a transition which has to be made between one state and the other. And there is a cost for doing that as well. So this is summarized in a simple diagram. So there is the state A and the state A prime, or left or right, whatever you want. Uh, and then there, are, there is the usual structure, like, like we said. So with a certain probability pi, zero I pick action, zero here, which returns me here with probability P naught, I get one, 
and one minus denote I get minus one, and then the same here. Okay, let me just, uh, I'm not writing everything back again, uh, but you know how to fill these things, and this will be just primed quantities, zero, P zero prime, one, one minus P zero prime minus one, and the same for this other policy, pi prime one, one, P one prime one, one minus P prime one, and minus one, and etc. One minus P one minus one, P one one. All right, and then there is this transition that can take place. So there is another action, which is the action of switching. You're here, you must decide, should I flip this? Or I can take a third action, that is I flip, I switch, I go the other way. So there is another action here, the action of switching. This action of switching, say no switching, that's no, not a good idea. Let's call it uh, action for switching, a sub s, will send you here with probability one. So if I decide to switch, I will not get shot in the middle. I can go through to the other thing. It's just an assumption for simplification. And then in this case, you, you get a, a cost. There is a, a negative reward minus CS, where CS is positive. That's the cost for the, for the fee to, that has to be paid in crossing the bridge. And the same thing happens the other way around, right? You can switch back and the same thing occurs. With probability one, you'll end up here paying the same cost. Now challenge. Can you do this calculation for that simple model? Give it a try. It's a Markov chain, so give it a try. <laughs> I can do this, okay? But it's painful. And clearly, we are not covering much of what the real world gives to us. Remember, we started with the game of Go. In the game of Go, there are, I don't know, 10 to the number of atoms of the universe states uh, available, right? There are, there are huge numbers that we don't deal with. If we were switching? You think so. <laughs> then you have to optimize. You have to optimize over a space which is the space of all possible policies, which is a simplex in a high dimensional space. Because for every state, you will have a number of actions you can take. So this, this policy lives in a space which is a simplex in a space which is embedded in a number of states times numbers of action dimensional space. Not easy, okay? There are other ways of doing this. That's what I mean. And what I want to get to is to show you how these calculations are actually performed. How can you compute in systems which are much more complicated than this, in general, the optimal policies? What are the challenges? Some things simplify, some others just don't go away. Some problems don't go away. Okay, so in order to do that, we have a little bit to go away from example and abstract a little. So uh, it's, it's, I mean, again, I know you might feel a little bit uneasy or talking about these things without having firm ground, but now the firm ground comes. We're gonna give definitions of what the Markov decision process, which has disappeared, was up above here, is and how to solve it, at least in principle, okay? And of course, you will discover or recover that all these examples, when you know exactly what the, these probabilities in general are and what the states are, are just mark of decision process. Okay. Can you talk about changing of probabilities to the changing of probabilities? Is it possible to implement that in this? So it's possible to have situations in which your policy changes with time. Strictly speaking, it's not needed unless your PT change as well. You can do that. 
you can do that. Again, if you know the full future evolution of your PTs, P as a function of times, you will be able to derive an equation for your pi. But again, it's more complicated because every, this, this is, again, something that happens in the space of states times actions times times. Okay, so it's huge dimensional space. But in principle, yes, it's possible to extend all this to non-stationary environments, which I will not discuss because it's just cumbersome from the viewpoint of, and you don't learn actually much more than what you learn in, uh, in, uh, in this specific case. So Markov decision processes, what are the ingredients? <coughs> Yeah? Because it's a cost. It's a negative reward. So I, I, did, I said that CS is positive, so I can interpret this as a cost. It's a minus a reward. It's a negative reward. So you're penalized. You have to pay something if you do that. It's indifferent in either way. Okay? It's just an example, one possible way of implementing this. Clearly, if, if there was no cost in switching, and you knew everything in, immediately, then you would switch to the best option of the two and stay there forever. But if there is a cost, then there is a, a non-trivial decision to be made. That's a, that's, that's a comment, actually, that I, want, I had to, to make before. So if gamma were zero, if you are, were to, totally myopic in this setup, and you get some reward out of them. So suppose that you always, the probabilities are such that both of them, both of these p's are larger than one half. So you always get something out of it. And you're totally myopic, so gamma is equal to zero. You would never switch, never. Because you have to pay a cost. And you don't want to pay a cost. You can get something positive out of this without moving. This happens irrespectively of whether, in this case, for instance, suppose in this case you always get plus one. This is the super biased case in your favor. But if you're greedy, you will never discover it. You will stick to this. Now, if you allow for some horizon, your gamma becomes even slightly larger than zero. Then it becomes a comparison. There's a comparison to be made. If I switch, I lose the opportunity of gaining something here because I'm switching and I'm paying a price. Is it worth of what, whatever I will get here? I don't know. I have to go there. So you see, in this case already, if you just have two states, then the horizon becomes important. And your decision making changes a lot depending on your horizon, if you are far-sighted or short-sighted. We will discuss about this later. It's not totally unrelated. You can get this question for the moment. because This will take us too far away, but we will discuss about this later. Uh, so I was erasing the board. Yep. What do you mean not coming? Yes. And, uh, one, one. Yes. It's in it's it's in general yeah. unclear from a priori. So if you look at the problem, it's very difficult to say from the outset whether it's going to be gamma dependent or not. Except in these cases where there's just a single statement where you know that you will be repeating your experience all the time so that, that, that really doesn't matter. It just scales the overall gain that you have. But otherwise, in multiple states, typically it's gamma dependent. There might be instances in which it is not. So Markov decision processes. Shortly, MDP. What are they? So what do you need? It, these are Markov chains. So first thing first, what do you need? 
states. Good. You may. States. There is a space of states, right? Which for us will be a, a discrete set of uh, states. We, we, we will always be numbering them, okay? Just for simplicity. It's not a restriction in general, but it's useful. Then there will be, it's a decision process, so there will be actions first. Remember the diagram. Okay, there are circles and then there are squares. <laughs> and then there are transitions. Actions. We'll get to transitions, never mind. <laughs> so there will be some action state space. So, so there, again, there is a set of options. In general, this might depend on the state, right? There are some things that you can do in one state and you cannot do in other. For instance, think about grid world. If you are in a corner, not all actions are available. You cannot go up. So in general, this depends on the state, okay? But an easy way around this is just suppose that all actions are available to all states, but the probability with which you would be able to take that action or this will change the environment is zero. So you can compensate for that, right? But that's a technical point. So states and actions. Uh, then, transition probabilities. So what are there? What are they? They are the probabilities of getting to a new state as prime given the state S and the action A. So that's why I was waiting for A, because the way you go from S to S prime depends on the action you take. Think again about this, this two, two state, two armed bandit. That's what, what it was. If you picked action zero or one, you would end up in the same state as before. So if I am in A and I decide to flip the coin, one of the two, I will stay in space A, in place A, because I'm not moving, okay? But if I decide another action, action I switch, I will be changing my state. So my final state as prime will be different from the initial one, okay? So transitions between states depend on the choice of actions. Then, rewards. rewards, yes, they are all over the place. Rewards, well, let's, let's go for rewards. So this reward is something which is a function of what? Of the state, of the action, and possibly also the arrival state. Okay. So there is this triplet which is always around, which is state, action, and new arrival state. And in doing this process, that is starting from a circle, going to a square, and moving to another circle, to all this process, you attribute some reward. This might be random, or might be deterministic, it depends. Okay. Here, in this case, for market decision process, we assume that this is the average reward you get while taking this sequence of actions and state. So do you recognize all these actions in the previous examples? All these things that appeared? Mm -hmm. Just one thing more to add. Observation, no. No, not observation because here we're talking about something in which observations are perfect. Like I told you, it, we are up above over there. So the policy in general, the policy, which is the thing I'm looking for, and it's important because this is the, the thing over which we want to optimize, right? So this is the policy, pi, of choosing an action. On what must it depend? So in the full reinforcement learning problem, like we said, it depends on all the previous history. But now I said this is a mark of the decision process and we know in which state we are. And this is the key property of mark of chains. Once you know where you are, you know what the future will be, at least in probability. So you don't need the full history here to make a decision. If you have access to the full state of the system, 
you don't need any knowledge of the past because everything is encoded in your actual position. And the future will depend just on where you stand now. So the policy for Markov decision processes, it's a probability distribution over actions which depends only on the current state. No, the point is that if the system is Markovian and you have access to the state, all the history is already there. It's a sufficient, this is a sufficient, in the statistical terms, this is sufficient statistics for all the past history. But we are, we are um, throwing away all non Markovian processes, which... At this stage, we are. That's why we said Markov decision process. The key point is that there might be an environment which itself is evolving in a Markovian way. So this might be true always. But the point is that we have access to the state. The, point, the key point is the observation. If the observation is the state of the system, then we can throw away all the history. And we can decide just on the basis of the current state. This is completely Irrealistic, unrealistic. Okay. In most situations, we do not have access to the full state. Because what is, what is the full state of the system? Think about physics. You, you would have to specify all the degrees of freedom of the system in order to be able to predict. For any macroscopic system, this is not, not the case. Seriously. <laughs> but this is very important because it helps us in shaping our concepts, our ideas, how we know how, what we can do in the case, in this ideal case where we were perfectly omniscient and then we just had to have to compute. It's just like feeling like gods for 20 minutes, okay? okay? And being able to predict. So again, this is perfect knowledge because we know what the rules of law are. We know how our system, these things are given to us. We know that. Just before, we know the P0 and P1 for the one arm bandit, two arm bandit, sorry. And we know that the system, the observations are perfect, so we just need to map states into actions and not histories into actions. Hope that's clear. Fine, then it, now it comes, uh, I, I will try to keep it in 15 minutes, so it's gonna be rather quick. Uh, so the goal, like we said, is to, uh, to optimize over, so there is one thing, which is the return, uh, which is the sum uh, over all time, starting from zero to infinity of gamma to the power t. And then there is reward that I get if I st if I'm in state ST, pick action AT and go into state ST plus one. Okay, this is along one trajectory. So I'm in state S, pick an action A, move that this will bring me to state S prime and then another action and will bring me another place. So this is a random quantity and we want to optimize one quantity which is called the value which is the expectation value with respect to the policy and the transition probability of R. That's the same thing as before, right? I'm just writing it down explicitly. This is the general definition. And the goal is optimize this over pi. Now, this is a classical, uh, what we will derive is a classical result in uh, decision-making theory. Uh, which will go under the name of the Bellman equation from Richard Bellman, the founding father of Markov decision processes. Uh, if you look into books, it's, it's, a, it's a bit convoluted and mathematical derivation. We will go for something which should be more intuitive to, to physicists, which takes a little bit of a long detour, but I think every step is, is clearer than just an abstract uh, uh, mathematical derivation. 
So we we'll try and go through all the steps of this derivation. So the first step is we have to, to write this thing explicitly. Okay. So, and one way to write this thing explicitly is we have to know after t steps where my agent will be. So this is ruled by what? This is ruled by, this is a Markov chain, right? This is ruled by the probability density of, over the states. And it obeys the Chapman Kolmogorov equation, which maps the distribution at one time into the distribution at the later times. Okay? So what is this Chapman Kolmogorov equation? Let's call rho at time t plus 1. This is the probability that my agent is in state S, let's say S prime, after t plus 1 step. So how can I connect this to the probability of being in a state S at the previous time? Because that's what I want to do. Well, if I was in state S at the previous time, then what can happen? I could pick an action A according to my policy. With that probability, according to this probability, I will be sent by the environment in a new state as prime. According to the probability P of S prime, which depends on S and on A. And all this is summed over all possible initial states and over all possible actions. So this is the equation which describes the evolution of the density under the policy pi, which I choose, and under the transition probability p, which is in the hands of the environment. And I cannot do anything about it, but I know it. So if I use this uh, quantity rho t, then I can write my expected reward as follows. This is going to be the sum over all the future of gamma to the power t times what? Well, at time t, I will be in position s with that probability. I will pick a pro a, an action with this probability. I will be sent into a new state with this probability. And I will get an average reward. And this, all this will be, have to be summed over states, action, and S prime, over triplets. Okay, do we all agree that this is the expectation value of this? Again, okay. So this thing is a triplet. It depends on where you are at time t, what action you will pick, and where you will be sent. The probability for each of these events are rho t, this is the probability of starting from s, pi a conditioned on s, which sends you here, and p of s prime conditioned on s and a, which sends you here. So these three make for the probability of the triplet s a s prime. After t steps, the probability of seeing a s s prime is given by this. Object now, because it's Markov. If you, if you really feel lost now, you better raise your hand immediately. Of course. This is what this is with the expectation of something which is happening in the future, starting from some initial distribution. At the beginning, your state is governed by some row zero s, from which you pick one state. Then you have your policy here. You consult with your policy and say, what action should I take? And the policy in your program says, you should pick action A, zero. And then you consult with the environment, which says, where are you going to send me? 
oh, given action A, zero, and theta, zero, I will send you to S1 with this probability. Fair enough. And then you move to the second step, and so on and so forth. No, it's just because we don't know in advance. We have to prove that the best policy, the one which maximizes this, is deterministic. But in general, this thing is a function of any policy. OK. So uh, that's good, but not super good yet, because we have all these cumbersome times here. So what we're going to do now is going to define one quantity, which is I call eta of s, which doesn't depend on time and is just sum over t going from 0 to infinity of gamma t times rho t of s. You see, this is the one that picks this object here. So we are going to rewrite this as sum over a s s prime eta of s by a of s p of s prime s a and then the word of s a s prime. What does this what does this thing mean? It's, it has a very simple interpretation. You remember I told you gamma can be interpreted as a probability of survival after each step. So this is nothing but the probability that I am in state S after T steps and I'm still alive. This thing. And then I sum over all of them. And then what does that mean? That this object is the time that I spent in a given state S before being killed. It's the overall residence time in state S. Average residence time. Before being killed. Okay, do you agree on this? Fine. Okay, now we have come with an expression which is more compact. And what we have to do, we have to optimize over VPI. So now we're going to do this as physicists do. So first thing, also mathematicians, but they do it more accurately than we do. First thing, we have to find the stationary points of this function with respect to pi. So we want to take derivatives of this object with respect to pi. What's the difficulty in this? Can you spot the difficulty? No? OK. So let's start with the, we're doing this. Right? I take the derivative with respect to pi. Does this depend on pi? No, this is the, again, this is the environment giving me the rewards. Okay? So pi has nothing to do with that. Does this depend on pi? No, this is how the environment evolves. It doesn't depend on how I choose my actions personally. Once an action is chosen, the environment will go that way, but it doesn't depend on the probability that I give. Does this depend on pi? I mean, it is pi. Does this depend on pi? Ah, and that's painful. Because it depends on pi in a very, very intricate way. It depends on pi through all times. And this depends on pi through this. So do, you want, do we want to take the gradient of this with respect to pi? Not sure. Huh? Fixed point? What do you mean? I mean, 
Yeah, I will argue that it's not the most efficient way of doing this calculation. So, is there a workaround for this? So this is something I actually, it, it's a trick that you have to learn, okay? Because it pops out in so many different domains of physics, and you might have even used that without paying attention to this. So what do you do when you have such a nasty thing? What, what, you would, what would be your ideal world? Um, my ideal world would be the situation in which this is independent of that. So I could have take, to take the derivatives with respect to this or with respect to that. But we said, okay, but this is not independent of that. And why it is not? Well, because it has to obey this. And then the idea pops up and say, well, perhaps I can try to optimize this thing regarding this object as an independent variable and using this as a constraint. Oh. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, who has ever heard about Martin C. Jarrow's? Martin C. Jarrow's action? Nobody. Okay, now you know how it works in a totally different setup. So if it pops up, that's the trick. Okay. So there's a price to pay for this. There's a price to pay for this, right? Because what we'll have to do is to introduce these dynamics as a constraint. And if you want to introduce a constraint in an optimization problem, what do you do? <coughs> Pardon? Lagrange multiplier. In order to do Lagrange multiplier, what do you have to put? The multiplier, <laughs> which is an additional function coming into the game. So the price to pay is that you decouple the dependence of this from this, but you will have another additional field or vector. I will ask another question. Who has ever done the hubbard stratonovich transformation in statistical physics? Ah. Uh, isn't that the same? It is the same. And there are many other things in theoretical physics that you do the same way. You decouple nasty nonlinearities by expanding into constraints when you have them. Okay. I will never be able to make it in three minutes. <laughs> And at 1 p.m. I have to leave. So I will just outline what we will do first tomorrow before moving to something else. We will do exactly what I said. The only thing is that rather than using this equation for rho, we will use directly an equation for eta. That is, the equation for the average residence time with killing probability. So what is the equivalent equation for this thing? I will write it down here. So eta obeys the following equation. Eta of s prime is equal to rho naught of s prime plus gamma sum over s and a of P, S prime condition on S and A by A S and then eta S. So the average residence time with killing or without obeys a closed equation. And this is all we need. This is the constraint we need in order to use this formula. So we can get, get rid of all this rho t around. Okay. Pardon? <laughs> it's a recursive formula, okay? Ever seen that? Probably not in this form, but in fact you have. We don't know. <laughs> okay? So for tomorrow, if you want to do the exercise, Try and prove this formula. We will start from this, from the combination of this expression and this formula tomorrow to derive the optimality equation and the 
result that we're looking for. See you tomorrow.